What's up guys, this is Jan for Chess24, is it 24? Yeah, yeah, 24. And in this video we will have a look at the game between Vladimir Kramnik and Pantala Hare Krishna, played in Shamkir. Another of these super tournaments, looks like there's non-stop super tournaments. Started with the Bangkok Open, the strongest of them all, then Zurich, Baden-Baden, and now Shamkir is running, featuring Wesley So, Vladimir Kramnik, Shak Mamadyarov, and many other top players. This game we shall have a look at is played in round number four. Vladimir Kramnik heading into this game three draws and Hare Krishna lost a game and had two draws. Um, Hare Krishna with the black pieces against Kramnik where normally you would expect some 1 knight f3 or 1 d4. But 2017 Kramnik has become very flexible in the opening and very capable of opening with 1 e4 as well. Maybe he saw something in Harry's customary openings that he liked. Harry played a lot of French, plays some Sicilians, probably Kramnik was happy ganging up on those sharper lines. But for this game, Harry Krishna went for the classical Rui Lopez. Actually, the Rui Lopez might be a small surprise, because in the few outings Kramnik had with 1e4, recently he's preferred the Italian, the Gioco Piano. But possibly that was directed against opponents playing the Berlin, and he had the feeling that Harry, more of a French player, would not be able to discuss the Berlin with Vladimir Kramnik, one of the big experts. It turns out that was not what Harry had in mind indeed. Instead he plays a line we've seen plenty in the World Championship match between Carlsen and Kayaki. Good old classical a6, knight f6, bishop e7, when Kramnik opts for... Can we call it the main line? I'm not quite sure if we're there. Rookie 1 is probably still the main line, but 6d3 is certainly catching up. For details, I would like to guide you to Peter Swidler's video series on Chess24, giving you a wide repertoire for this move d3, which also featured heavily in the World Championship match. b5, that's the main move, bishop to b3 and d6, threatening to pick up this bishop by going knight a5. So why does it do something? And the reason for the renaissance of this line is the little move a3, doesn't look like much, just clearing the a2 square for the bishop and planning to play in the center with knight c3 and sometimes knight d5. Surprisingly, black has not found it easy to neutralize this plan. I could talk for hours about the theoretical implications here. Implications? Variations? I, but I probably won't. Castles, knight c3, knight a5 is a move we've seen in the match. Bishop e6 is another move we've seen in the match. And knight to b8 might look strange, but actually featured in the match as well, played by Carlsen in the tie breaks. A move I first seen employed by Wesley So, who also happens to play in this tournament. Of course, knight b8 looks very strange, voluntarily losing a couple tempi. The idea is that the knight on c6 is misplaced, as it often is in these structures, and that black wants to either go for, what do we call this, a briar setup, knight bd7 followed by bishop b7, or put his pawn on c5 and then maybe follow up with knight c6. Now, you might argue, and you wouldn't be wrong, if you want to put your pawn on c5, why not go knight a5, bishop a2, c5, which is another line. But knight b8 gives extra flexibility because of this option to play knight bd7, sometimes even knight c5, bishop e6. Long story short, it's a playable move that gives white tons of options on the next move. I could list all kinds of sensible moves here. a4 has been played, bishop e3 I'm sure has been played, a3, bishop g5, bishop a2, Knight d5, do we have enough arrows? Maybe not quite yet. And knight to e2 played in the game, very typical move as well. Because the white knight on c3, if it doesn't have access to this d5 square, where right now it could get kicked away after takes followed by c6, so knight d5 is not that appealing. It's a typical journey for, for him, for it, for the knight to go to g3 in these structures. Knight e2 and Harry decides to play knight bd7. This deviates from the Kayak and Carlsen match where Carlsen went for the move c5 in this position. Knight bd7, typical idea is to follow up with knight c5 and bishop e6, which is the reason why Kramnik doesn't play knight g3 here, where knight c5, bishop a2, bishop e6 is considered to be kind of okay for black. Therefore, Kramnik goes c3, preparing to withdraw his bishop to c2, should it get harassed by knight c5. That was still an option, but Harry goes for bishop to b7, 
I always have mixed feelings about this bishop on b7 against the d3 e4 formation because it doesn't really do all that much there. And I would guess that Kramnik was quite happy with his position here out of the opening. Knight to g3. Now Harry goes for c5. And rook to e1. Just protecting. My apologies. And there's no way we're cutting this up, just so you know. c5, rook to e1, protecting the e4 pawn, sometimes preparing d4, but in this case more anticipating black play with c4, making it harder to get to the e4 pawn. Rook to c8, once again hinting at c5 to c4. And here, kind of surprisingly, Kramnik decides to ignore that idea, because he could play a little prophylactic move, like let's say bishop to a2, so c4 doesn't come with tempo. And then if black goes c4, you take, and let's say, bishop g5. Whenever I say let's say, I normally read out the computer move. So let's say bishop g5, and uh, white is better here. Because these pawns are a little vulnerable. Instead, Kramnik goes for knight to f5 directly. Very logical, grabbing this bishop and putting the knight on a pretty menacing square. But allowing the only counterplay black has, and the counterplay that was pretty much telegraphed by rook to c8, c5 to c4, to undermine this e4 pawn. Now, bishop a2 is a bit late because of c takes d3, queen takes d3, let's say knight to c5, ganging up on poor Mr. e4. Bishop c2 was still possible, but it feels a little passive too, let's say takes, takes, and once again knight c5. Black is very much in business. Therefore, Kramnik goes for d takes c4. But now the situation has changed quite sharply. After bishop takes e4, black has eliminated both white central pawns on d3 and e4 and drastically activated his passive bishop from b7. Of course, white can get the two bishops, but the central control he's relinquished should be pretty good compensation for black. There's many options here. Maybe there's, Kramnik was thinking about some attacking gestures like knight h4, but it just runs into b takes c4, so there's really no time. Rook takes e4 would be a very drastic measure, knight takes e4 and c takes b5, which the computer considers to be almost equal, but it does look a little desperate. Instead, Kramnik decides to play the logical move, knight takes e7, queen takes e7, c takes b5, freeing his bishop, a takes b5, and now went for a move that he yeah, has very committal. Or maybe the next two, three move combination is actually the committal one. But he goes for bishop to g5, which looks very logical, pinning. The reason why I'm saying it's committal is this bishop, once it gets harassed back with h6 and g5, might end up on a pretty passive outpost. Is that, is that an oxymoron, passive outpost? On a pretty passive square on g3. Bishop g5, knight to c5. Bishop to a2. Bishop c2 is always possible here. And maybe it was the way to go, actually. But it feels counterintuitive to exchange the so-called Spanish bishop on this long diagonal, give up the two bishops. So in this position, it was probably a better choice than bishop to a2. Because now after h6, it's hard for white to keep the tension. Kramnik does try, always very ambitious, especially with the white pieces. Bishop to h4. Bishop takes f6. Might once again be a safer choice, but it's certainly not what Kramnik had in mind. Something like this looks a bit artificial. I take black here. So bishop to h4. And g5. Looks double-edged at first sight, but it's really just a classy move. Locking this bishop out. Bishop to g3. And we see this, but now it's the white bishop. We've had a similar scenario for the black bishop earlier on b7. The white bishop that is sort of incarcerated by the black pawns. And it's not a position where you can enjoy your two bishops, really. Bishop to h7 by Hare Krishna. I'm not sure why not bishop to g6, but the idea is the same. He wants to clear the way for his knight to go to e4, then his king to unpin, and then the f-pawn to come chasing this bishop even further away 
by playing f5, f4. Well, for white without central pawns, it's really hard to come up with anything overly constructive. Queen e2 played by Kramnik, king to g7, rook a to d1. Computer is not a big fan of rook a d1, but once again, these are natural moves. The white position is just hard to play already. Well, black has a very clear plan, knight f e4. And now the f pawn, Facundo, as Pepe Cuenca likes to call him, is ready to do damage. White has to do something about it. The reason I chose this game really is the next two moves, where Kramnik does something very, very drastic and very interesting, which we don't see much at this level. And I don't think he did this to win any beauty prizes. He did this sort of out of desperation, but also because he understands that sometimes it's worth doing something um, pretty dramatic in order to change the trend of a game that's not going well. If he were to play naturally, let's say h3, f5, bishop h2, f4, black would just enjoy his position because of the severely restricted bishop without having to do anything overly complicated. So, long story, not that short. Rook to d5 was played. You might wonder what's the point after f5, rightly so. The point is to sacrifice something on e5. First thing that comes to mind is to go knight takes e5, when after d takes e5, bishop takes e5, white would be in pretty good shape. But the problem with knight takes e5 is that f4 seems strong. Trapping this bishop, not allowing it to get active. Black emerges with extra material where it seems like white doesn't get, doesn't get quite enough play for it. Bishop takes e5 does make a lot of sense because after d e5, once again, you do not get enough for your investment. So that only leaves one piece to sacrifice on e5. And that happens to be Mr. Rook. Should be mentioned, for completeness sake, that the computer prefers to sacrifice his rook on d6. Similar idea, knight takes d6, bishop takes e5 check. But rook takes e5 is spectacular enough. d takes e5 forced, bishop takes e5 check, and Kramnik has sacrificed a rook for two pawns in order to free his bishop and alter the course of this game. The the thing is, he's gonna get another pawn, and all of a sudden his pieces, especially this passive-looking bishop on g3, are incredibly active. Kramnik, I believe, had no illusions about his position. He said it should be better for black, and the computer would win this 10 times out of 10. But over the board, and Harry was in a bit of time trouble here already, this position is not easy to play. Queen takes b5, grabs the third pawn for the rook. So numerically speaking, if we say rook is 5 points, and pawns are 1 point, White is only two points down. He has the two bishops. The black king is a little weak, so you could factor that in as well. This position is not easy to play because the white pieces are so active. And if the pieces don't get anything done, the pawns can still roll down the board. Having said all that, a rook is a rook and black should be better here. Knight to e4 played, logical move, blocking the e-file and coordinating the knights. Bishop to d4 stepping out of the way and preparing to go knight to e5, also pinning this knight on e4. And rook f d8. This looks like a natural enough move, keeping the option to eliminate this bishop if needed, but I think it's a step off the right way. And by I think, I mean the computer says. Instead, it seems that the way to go was to put this rook on e8, not d8. The plan is to go rook to b8, followed by queen to d6, when the black pieces coordinate much better. Let's say h3, useful little luft, rook b8, queen e2 to keep this pawn, and queen d6, and we see this rook is actually doing damage on the open file, keeping white very busy, controlling the e5 square. It doesn't seem like white is in time to develop any initiative here, so the black extra rook would sooner rather than later become a factor. Instead, rook f d8, pawn to h3, Rook b8, queen e2, and we have a similar situation, but here queen d6 runs into bishop e5, and things are a lot less clear. Harry played bishop g8, trying to neutralize this strong bishop, but the problem is this bishop gets out of the way and finds a new very promising diagonal, because on this diagonal was where the black king was playing to find a home on h7 or g6, with this bishop looming here. That's going to be a lot harder to do. So all kinds of g4s in the air. Queen to b7. 
targets the beat pawn. But what nicer move in time travel to make than b2 to b4, pushing your passed pawns up the board. Rook to e8, Harry now found the correct square for the rook, but he lost some time with his bishop g8, queen b7. And Kramnik keeps playing very, very good moves, even though with hindsight and watching those, those are simple moves, pushing his passed pawns, c4, creating a nice square for his queen on b2 to occupy this diagonal. Easier to play with white than with black. And well played by Kramnik. Computer says black is still better here after queen to a6. Not the most obvious of moves, but a double attack against both these pawns. However, the lines are already insanely complicated. For example, b5, queen takes a3, bishop takes e4, and don't ask me why, rook bd8 being the best move. I honestly don't know why. Why not rook takes e4, like a normal person? Then queen d2, and apparently white is enough play. So things are getting out of hand here very quickly. Maybe instead of b5, queen b2 is a more natural move. Once again, trying to use this pin. And after bishop takes c4, it seems like black keeps everything under control, but in time trouble. Not an easy situation to handle. There's so many jumps and captures to take into account at every juncture. So queen a6, the computer move. Queen c6, the move played by Hare Krishna. Same idea, but not targeting a3 and also opening the door for some knight e5 with tempo. Queen b2 played, nice little move, increasing the pressure once again. The difference here is that after bishop c4, knight e5 does attack the queen. Let's say queen e6. How do we do this? Bishop takes e4. And if f takes e, knight takes c4, or even more strongly, knight g4, picks up material on this diagonal. Now for queen b2, I guess already fairly unpleasant surprise for Hare Krishna. King h7 was the most resilient, but I've mentioned earlier, it's very hard to step into this diagonal and to have all these headaches about g4. So Hari came back to his idea of, if necessary, eliminating this bishop on d4 by going rook bd8. But this gives white a crucial tempo to safeguard his pawns. Kremnik plays c5. Computer says b5 was even stronger, but in a practical game you play c5 here. And the going gets tough, because now black not only has to worry about his weakened king, but the white pass pawns have advanced quite a bit from c3 and b2 to c5 and b4, while black really hasn't made a lot of headway over the last couple moves. And with these guys ready to run even further, the position has become very very hard to handle. Queen e6 anticipating b5, and b5 is indeed played. Um, here we are, where are we? Move number 36. As we said, that in Shamkir they play with no increment. That means the players don't get the nowadays almost customary 30 extra seconds after every move they make, but they have to make it to the time control on move 30 at their own terms. And Hare Krishna wasn't serious time travel here which does not make the defense any easier. The only defense that was still left was the move queen to b3, offering the exchange of queens, which I'm sure he considered. But the problem is white steps out the way, goes queen to a1, and keeps all this pressure. When here, in order to stay in the game, you had to find the move king g6. Once again, I think earlier I gave king h7 as the best move. All these decisions are so hard to step into this diagonal. For example, here you have to anticipate that something like this doesn't kill you. You can't recapture it because of knight d4 check. So you have to go back, king g7, knight d4, queen to d5, and apparently black is still very much in the game. Instead, Hare Krishna decided to unpin by putting his king to f8, but that turns out to be the decisive mistake because he's once again not really generating any counterplay, just allowing white to push his pawns further up the board. And after c6, the threats become too many since the c7, b6 factor is huge. And the black king is not terribly safe on f8 either. Queen b4 check, looming, bishop c5 check, knight e5. Not a fun position to play. That's been true all along, but now it's also objectively a lost position. Harry decides to at least mix it a little bit. Still in time travel here, go for some counterplay with g4, which objectively accelerates the end. 
there was no good solution left anymore. H takes G, F takes G, Bishop takes E4. If Knight takes E4, Rook takes E4, Queen takes E4, Bishop G7 check, King E7 and checkmate one move. Queen F6 check ends the game quite neatly. Therefore, Hare Krishna, when G takes F3, Bishop takes F6, now he's pretty much lost when it comes to the material count white hairs. What do we have? Bishop and three pawns for the rook, but more importantly, the black king is extremely exposed and the white pawns are about to queen. So materially, Hare Krishna has lost here. I could imagine that from afar he was relying on queen g4 as a last trick, threatening queen g2 checkmate using these two pins. But after queen g4, well, there's many wins, but the easiest is queen b4 check, king f7, bishop d5 check with a discover check. Is that a discover check? If we attack the queen? Anyway, winning the queen. Let's say rook takes d5, queen takes g4, rook takes e1, king h2, king f6, queen takes f3, and the white queen plus passes. Will prove to be much stronger than the black army. Instead, Rook to d6 was played. This is move number 40, so he made it to the time control. But white has a choice of ways to roam. Does that make sense? Data roaming. Um, and Kramnik decides to finish the game with bishop g7 check, king f7, and bishop to e5. Nice little tactic, because queen e5 once again, bishop g6, picks up the queen, similar to the line we just saw. Well, if this rook were to move, well, the position is too ugly to even look at. Rook to d8, anything wins. c7, bishop takes f3. If you want to be a computer, you can go bishop h8, threatening queen g7 checkmate. And Hare Krishna had seen enough after bishop e5 and decided to resign. I'm guessing you guys have seen enough as well, because I've been talking about this game non-stop. But I hope you liked it. Here we see... Vladimir Kramnik and Hare Krishna before the game. I certainly did enjoy this game because you don't see such an idea very often at the highest level or any level really. Giving a rook for two pawns, rook to d5. With hindsight, maybe Hare Krishna is going to think I could have played rook e8 first, didn't have to go for this. But rook d5, f5, rook takes e5. Vladimir Kramnik saving a bad position or converting a bad position into a mess which he then went on to win in style impressive stuff by the former world champion thank you guys for watching this video and i hope i'll see you in the next one if i ever do the next one i probably will bye bye